What if? It's the question on many of our lips when we face a significant decision. For the anxious and the apprehensive amongst us, we may ask, what if I can't do it? What if people reject me? What if it all goes wrong? But the young Australian poet Erin Hansen turns that question on its head. What if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? Just ponder that for a moment as we consider the choices that lay ahead of us. The fear or excitement of what ifs might shape our future. But just imagine how life today would be so different without the what ifs of yesterday. What if Hitler had died on the battlefields of World War I? What if Edward VIII didn't abdicate the throne? What if JFK survived? What if the Beatles had split up? What if Isaac Newton had never been born? What if the World Wide Web was still merely a pipe dream? What if chocolate was never invented? A different outcome to some of these scenarios would have changed the course of human history. Some of them would just have made our days a little bit duller. But it got me wondering, what would have happened if the disciples of Jesus had made different choices? What if they chose to ignore the words of Jesus? The Bible reading we read earlier comes just before Pentecost. Jesus says to the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A few days later, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. But imagine what would have happened if the disciples had said, hmm, I don't think that's literal. We kind of like living in Jerusalem. It's the holy city, the place we were made to be, full of home comforts. And Judea, well, that's a long walk. And it's hot down there, so actually we'll stay in Jerusalem. And Samaria? Forget about it, they hate us in Samaria and we hate them. They do everything differently over there. The Samaritans have messed up the proper religious way of doing things, so there's no way we're going there. And the ends of the earth? No way. They eat pork at the ends of the earth. They're unclean and full of unholy habits and pagan practices, and the weather is awful. Jerusalem is our holy land. It's where we believe the Messiah will come back to, so we're never ever leaving this land. The ends of the earth is too far. We're going to stay here in Jerusalem and grow our church from here. Just imagine if they'd said that. Imagine how history would have turned out. Let me ask the question another way. What would the church look like today if that's what the first apostles had done? If they'd only stayed in Jerusalem? Imagine what the church would look like if nothing had ever changed. We wouldn't be speaking English in church. Women would have their heads covered. We wouldn't have printed Bibles in front of us. Nor would we have sung any of the songs we sing in church, or probably hardly any songs at all. It would be very different. But here's the thing. The first disciples did change and adapt things, and quite quickly. The first apostles didn't decide to stay in Jerusalem, but filled with the Holy Spirit, they went into Judea and into Samaria, and literally to the ends of the earth. By the end of Acts, Paul is in Europe. These weren't well-travelled people who were used to adapting to new contexts, and transport was nowhere near what it's like today. But yet, they left behind their home comforts. They left the places where they could speak the language and they pushed on into the world with the gospel. Actually, 
That's what the word apostle means. The sent one. The one moving out and pushing ahead and onwards. The church then has always been on a journey of pushing out, of finding new frontiers, of marching onward. So what about us today? If we're speaking in terms only of Acts 1 verse 8, surely it's job done. The church has made it to the ends of the earth. The Salvation Army itself is present in 132 countries. The church has certainly gone beyond Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and even made it to Wibsey. Does that mean we no longer need apostles? The text we read earlier from Ephesians tells us that apostles, or being apostolic, is an essential ingredient for the church. It's something that is what all churches should be looking at. Now, does that mean we should be finding some remote point on the map and moving there to plant a new fellowship? Not exactly. Here's the thing. Jesus' apostolic charge to his disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth isn't just about geography. It's not just about new places. The world is changing rapidly. It's a different world. The strangeness of the ends of the earth can be seen around us. Just think about all the changes that have happened in the last 10, 20, 30 years. What does this mean for religion? What does this mean for Christianity? In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy says to her dog, Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Dorothy recognises that they are in a place that is unfamiliar and unusual. It's outside their comfort zone, yet that is where they are. As the apostles obediently responded to Jesus, they found they weren't in Jerusalem anymore. Just as the disciples found that in leaving Jerusalem, they had to change their methods, they had to speak new languages, they had to figure out new cultures. So too do we today. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you just can't get yourself understood? Perhaps you're trying to order food whilst on a holiday abroad. Or you're trying to speak to an older relative who hasn't got their hearing aid in. Or you were just trying to communicate through a face mask. What do you do? Probably like every Brit abroad, you speak louder and more slowly. Hoping that somehow all language barriers will suddenly break down. But we can't just shout louder and speak more slowly, hoping that people will hear us. What worked in Jerusalem won't work in Samaria or at the ends of the earth. Through Bill Billy Graham's preaching ministry, nearly three million people responded to the message of Jesus. The impact of his ministry in his day was immense. But much of what he said is a foreign language today. So what does it mean for us to be apostles today? We have to be prepared to let go of the comfort of our Jerusalem. Even when that's our home and where we'd rather be. We have to take risks and try new things as a church in order to reach people and connect with people. We have to be willing to learn new languages and be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. We have to be radical in how we embrace other people. People who are different from us in all kinds of ways. We have to do everything we can to be inclusive of new people who think differently to us. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing, the main thing being the gospel. It's the story of God and his redeeming love for all the world. And it's this story that has the power to change lives. We have to keep that the main thing. 
above our personal preferences and tastes. Now, some of this might sound obvious or it might sound uncomfortable. The thing is, for Salvationists, this shouldn't be new. This is right at the heart of what the Salvation Army is all about. William Booth found there were many people the churches of Victorian England just weren't reaching. People who thought that Christianity, or rather the church, was irrelevant for them. They were poor, homeless, jobless and hungry, and religion just wasn't the answer. So what did Booth do? He gave them jobs and homes and food. Church music and services were too hard for them to understand and appreciate. So what did he do? He used brass bands, popular music of the day. His ministers and recruits wore innovative fashion, bonnets. And thus the army grew, spreading from nation to nation. Frederick Booth Tucker, son-in-law of William Booth, took these very successful methods to India. And what happened? They didn't work. So they changed. Tucker saw the Indian caste system as his main obstacle. And so he decided to work among India's 60 million outcasts. He and his fellow Salvationists adopted the way of life of the outcasts. Their Salvation Army uniforms were replaced with the saffron robes and they assumed Indian names. Tucker being known as Fakir Singh, meaning the Lion of God. And the army exploded in India. The gospel doesn't change. The gospel changes us. And as it changes us, we live out love in the world. We learn to speak the good news and it's powerful. It pushes us forward. The world needs the gospel more than ever. It's a story of God's unconditional love. It's a story that proves that even the darkest days can be filled with light. It's a story that seeks out hardened and broken hearts and sees them healed and restored. It's a story that fights for justice, gives a voice to those who have no voice, calls us to befriend the friendless, feed the hungry, be compassionate to those in need. It's a story that gives a home to wandering hearts. It's a story that stills restlessness, fills emptiness, gives purpose and direction and meaning and hope and life and light. It's the story of a God who will stop at nothing. He will leave the heights of heaven to sleep in the depths of a manger. He will stop at nothing to find one lost sheep, one lost coin, one lost son. It's the story of a man who sees a stranger beaten at the side of the road and asks no questions, but jumps straight in to help. It's the story that welcomes in sinners and doubters and questioners and vagabonds and don't belongs and winners and losers and rich and poor, the despised and the celebrated. You know the stories, don't you? You know the good news stories of the gospel. You know the difference that this story makes to the world, don't you? You know the power it can have to transform and to heal and to restore and to create. You know that whilst the hosts of hell rage on, this story will make a difference. The question then, if we do know this story, is will we go? Will we be prepared to leave the comfort of Jerusalem? Will we be prepared to push on to new places? I can't help but as I ask these questions to think about the lyrics of all the good old army songs which are perhaps out of fashion these days. While millions wait whose need is great, we must not God's plans frustrate. On we march with the blood and the fire, to the ends of the earth we will go. Sit no longer idly by while the heedless millions die. Lift the blood-stained banner high and dare or die for Jesus. The world for God I give my heart. 
I will do my part. The question is, will we go? Maybe today you're like, Claire, the ends of the earth. I can barely make it out of bed in the morning. My circumstances and my energy levels make me ask all of the negative what ifs. Well, let's go full circle. Back to the text from Acts 1. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Today we have the opportunity to receive the Spirit's anointing afresh. When we fully give ourselves over to God, he gives us the courage to step out, to step beyond and to step into the glorious future we can have with him. We might say, what if I fall? God says, but what if you fly? God bless you.